Hello, so in the previous lecture we started discussing branching and we specifically looked at the case of hyper branched polymers. We uh, developed a few expressions uh, involving the number average degree of polymerization and weight average degree of polymerization of uh, such hyper branched polymers uh, with respect to the extent of uh, reaction as well as the functionality of the monomers involved. So, uh, in today's lecture we will continue our discussion of branching and branched polymers further where uh, apart from the randomly branched hyper uh, polymers that we have discussed till now, we will uh, look at the case of uh, branched polymer which is highly ordered and where the branching is uh, uh, very controlled and such polymers are referred to as dendrimer. So, we will look at the specific case of uh, dendrimer in today's lecture as another example of a polymer that is highly branched. but uh, highly ordered as well. We, after that we will move on to discussing the case of network polymers and we will specifically look at how cross linking of polymer chains results in the formation of such uh, network structures. We will talk about the uh, this transition um, where the formation of network results um, uh, through the cross linking with, uh, between different chains and uh, this uh, transition um, is uh, that we will be discussing in this regard is referred to as gelation. So, the network polymer that forms starting from the initial reaction mixture that uh, network polymer is uh, will is referred to as gel and the transition where the first network polymer spanning the entire system that we have appears uh, this uh, um, transition is ref, uh, referred to as gelation. Um, regarding the contents as uh, discussed the randomly branched polymers uh, will be briefly reviewed and after that we will talk about dendrimers which are also highly branched but uh, very ordered polymer structures. Then we will move on to uh, the formation of networks where the uh, high amount of branching can ultimately lead to cross linking between chains and formation of network structures and gels. And we will briefly discuss a, a few results um, arising out of uh, uh, what is called the mean field uh, model of gelation. To start with uh, in the previous class we talked about the case of a hyper branched polymer that can form by polymerization of a monomer of uh, type A R B F minus 1. So, A and B here as we discussed earlier are the reactive functional groups and um, A can only react with B or B can react with A but A cannot react with A and B cannot react with B that is the constraint that we have. So, if you look at uh, this monomer here um, hyper branch polymers we discussed will be formed if f is greater than 2. So, this uh, f that we have that is referred to as the functionality of the monomer and that uh, in uh, this case we can consider as a total number of functional groups present on a given monomer molecule. We have f minus 1 b uh, uh, functional groups and 1 a functional groups So total f functional groups are present per monomer molecule. So, the functionality is f. So, that is what this f represents. Um, although strictly speaking the functionality for uh, uh, any given monomeric species is not necessarily equal to the number of functional groups present, it is uh, equal to the number of uh, um, chains that can arise out of a given monomeric unit. For our purposes, uh, it is uh, the number of functional groups present the monomer is uh, in, in our discussion will be equivalent to the functionality, because all the functional groups present in our discussion will lead to the formation of uh, or emanation of chains from the monomer. This uh, here was the small uh, section of a typical hyper branch molecule that can form uh, if uh, polymerization of uh, ARB F minus 1 type of monomer is done. And if we consider this uh, encircled uh, portion to be the main uh, chain, so in that case uh, this part can be considered as a branch similarly this part can be considered as a branch and out of this branch this further branch uh, shown here that is also arising. And if uh, polymerization is carried out if we uh, connect further A groups to the end B groups that we have then further branching um, is of course possible. So, uh, we end up getting a highly branched hyper branched polymer. And that is what we discussed in the previous class and we also derived the expressions for its weight average and number average degree of polymerization and how uh, those quantities relate to the functionality and the extent of reaction. Uh, apart from 
the, this kind of monomers, uh, we can also have other kind of monomer combinations which uh, can result in branched polymers. If we consider a polymerization of uh, uh, a system containing two types of monomers A or B and B3. So, first monomer has uh, one A functional group and one B functional group, the second monomer has just three uh, B functional groups. So, such uh, and again A and B are mutually reactive, but uh, will not react with uh, uh, each other in the sense that the A will not react with A or B, B will not react with B, but A and B will um, react uh, together. So, uh, in, in this case the fi bi functional monomer which uh, contains two functional groups A or B and the tri functional monomer B3 is present and typically if you have a small amount of trans functional monomer present then uh, such uh, a system can also upon polymerization leads, lead to branched polymers. And uh, how that happens if we just look at a schematic, if we consider a B3 kind of monomer first containing 3 functional groups of type B, uh, then reaction can of the exposed B functional groups can only occur with the A functional group of the bi functional mo monomer that we have. So, the B functional group can react with the A functional group and similarly for the other B functional groups present. So, uh, to start with we see that we have a, a structure where kind of a branching point is there. So, the, this point which corresponds to the tri-functional monomer unit that acts as a branching point and for this, uh, this specific case it turns out that for uh, a given polymer chain only one branch will be formed. The reason is that uh, once, uh, once uh, one stage of reaction is over and we have these A, B, uh, monomers connected to the B3 monomer, then uh, the next uh, uh, step of reaction will again involve the reaction of uh, A groups of the AB monomer to the uh, B groups at the end here. Okay. So, if we consider uh, another stage in the reaction, then uh, the exposed B um, functional groups will react with the A functional groups um, of the AB monomer and in that way the chain size will increase, but that will not lead to the creation of any additional branch points. So, we see that we still have this only single branch point and the chains can continue growing larger in uh, different directions, but the uh, there will just be single branch point per chain and if uh, other chains are parallelly growing they will also have a single branch point. So, this kind of uh, uh, monomer combination leads to branched polymers, but these are not highly branched. Uh, these usually will contain um, single branch uh, per chain. Okay, so, these are certain examples of uh, monomer combinations uh, where branch branching is possible and um, it can be uh, uh, the degree of branching can be small or it can be large as in the case of hyper branch polymers. And we see that it is necessary that one of the monomers have functionality greater than 2 only then uh, branching is possible. If all monomers have functionality to then a linear polymers will result. Okay. So, the cases that we have considered till now they um, involve um, kind of random branching. Okay. So, there is no um, order involved in the kind of branching that is uh, uh, that is taking place. So, now uh, next we will consider a case of a type of polymer that where the branching is very ordered and, and controlled so, so that the structure that we get, the polymer structure that we get that also comes out to be very ordered. So, such polymers are refer, referred to as dendrimers and uh, these are also highly branched structures, but uh, as discussed the, uh, the branching is not ra random and it is the structure these are uh, highly ordered um, molecules. So, again uh, we consider the same case where uh, we have uh, uh, monomers containing A and B functional groups and this A and B are mutually reactive, but A and A will not react same B will B and B will not react. We consider the polymerization of uh, the, this kind of combination of monomers A R B F minus 1 plus uh, this R B N. So, again here R is some group which is uh, not involved in uh, any polymerization reaction. So, it is R is not a functional group and the A and B are the functional groups participating in the reaction. Now, if we carry out the polymerization of uh, uh, this kind of a monomer combination and if it is done um, in a controlled way, 
then one can actually um, uh, get dendrimer molecules uh, out of such reactions. So, if the functionality again of this molecule is greater than 2 and we have this uh, molecule where n typically will also be greater than 2. So, in such a case uh, uh, control reaction can uh, be uh, performed uh, to form dendrimers. Th this RBN this monomeric unit that uh, monomer molecule that we have typically this will form as what is called the core of the dendrimer molecule and starting from it A or B F minus 1 these uh, monomer molecules will react with the B functional groups of uh, the core and they will um, uh, the molecule pr will progressively grow larger, uh, but the or an order kind of structure will be maintained. An example can be where f is equal to 3, so and n is also equal to 3. So, in that case we have an a r b 2 plus uh, b 3 or we can also call it r b 3. So, r was not mentioned explicitly here because that is not a functional group, but in, in any case a core monomer which uh, contains 3 b functional groups. So, that is that can be an example of a system that uh, uh, if done if the um, reactions are done properly and in a controlled way can produce dendrimer molecules. So, uh, uh, let us start with uh, how the dendrimer molecules schematically um, let us see how the dendrimer molecules form. So, we have this uh, for this case we have this uh, B 3 molecule which forms the core of the dendrimer or B 3 monomer which forms the core of the dendrimer and then at each of the B functional groups that we have here the A functional group of this A or B 2 can react. So, if that is done we have this kind of a connectivity where all the 3 B groups here have been have reacted with uh, these A functional groups and the molecule has grown in size and now uh, the instead of the initial 3 B functional groups at the core now we have 6 B functional groups at the periphery of our uh, this growing dendrimer molecule. And uh, further those uh, the peripheral B groups can again react with the A groups uh, of the A or B 2 uh, monomeric uh, species present and this will lead to further growth of the monomer um, of the dendrimer in, uh, in an ordered fashion. Um, if uh, another uh, set of reactions takes place then uh, we have we get more number of these B functional groups at the periphery again. So, there we had 6 now we see we have 12 and uh, if we look at the core the B 3 that is uh, um, as we discussed referred to as the core from which the uh, growth of the dendrimer molecule starts. And after all the B groups have been uh, of the core have been reacted with the A groups of the other monomer then uh, and one single layer is complete then that uh, that is called uh, the first generation of the dendrimer. And similarly um, uh, the, the B groups of the at the surface of this first generation if they once they are reacted with um, the A groups of the A or B 2 type uh, uh, monomers then uh, then the second generation will form and the second generation is what is uh, uh, shown here at the um, periphery. So, we see that uh, starting from the core which can be called as a 0th generation as we increase the generation from 1 to 2 to 3 the dendrimer molecule grows in size and uh, the number of uh, functional groups the B functional groups in this case present on the surface that also increases very rapidly. And we can also notice that as the dendrimer molecule will grow to higher generations uh, the crowding at the surface of this molecule will become higher and higher because uh, as the generation will uh, increase more and more number of uh, fun B functional groups will be present on the surface and ultimately there would not be enough space to accommodate um, all the uh, molecules at the surface. And this uh, overcrowding is one of the problems associated with uh, uh, synthesizing very high generation dendrimers. So, as we have discussed uh, the dendrimers can be formed of, uh, by polymerization of uh, this general kind of combination of monomers provided that f is greater than 2 and for the simple case where f and n both are 3 we can have a dendrimer 
that up to the second generation looks like this. So, now look, look now let us uh, consider the each generation of the dendrimer in more detail and see how the number of monomers involved per generation that actually increases as we go higher in generations. So, for the 0 generation which is the code we have just one monomer molecule which is a B3 type molecule uh, in this case or the BN uh, uh, molecule for the general case. And then in the next generation which is the, the first generation the number of monomer molecules will be n. The reason for this is that uh, in the code we have n functional groups of type B and, and when this first generation forms then all these uh, n uh, functional groups of type B would have reacted uh, with uh, uh, each uh, uh, B functional group would have, would have reacted with one molecule of this type. So, in the first generation we will have n number of uh, monomer molecules uh, of uh, this type. Uh, and uh, once uh, we have n number of monomer molecules in this first generation the number of B functional groups which will again each react with uh, one mo monomer molecule. So, the number of B functional group uh, on the surface of this first generation dendrimer uh, will simply be n times f minus 1 because if you have n monomer molecules of uh, this type each monomer molecule of this type has f minus 1 um, functional groups of type B. So, total number of B functional groups on the surface at first generation will be n times f minus 1 and when the second generation forms all these B groups would have reacted. Uh, with uh, uh, one mon uh, monomer molecule each of again the A or B F minus 1 type. So, in generation 2 the number of monomers that uh, that will be present will be n times F minus 1 because this is the number of uh, surface B groups present on the in, in the first generation. So, uh, if we take the example of the schematic shown here then we can see that in, in generation 0 at the core we have 1 a monomer molecule. In generation 1 which is represented by the green uh, circle here we have uh, these 3 monomer molecules and in the next generation generation 2 which is uh, shown by this orange circle here we can see that we have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 monomer molecules involved and these are consistent with the expressions that we have here. So, at generation uh, 0 we have 1 B 3, in generation 1 we have n which in this case is 3. So, that is what we got, we got the 3 monomer molecules. In generation 2 since n and f both are 3 this product will simply be 6 and that is what we got uh, for generation 2. So, continuing in this fashion what we can see is that uh, in generation 2 again if we have n times f minus 1 monomer molecules. Uh, and each monomer molecule has f minus 1 um, functional groups of type B. So, uh, so in the next generation all these type B functional gr groups will uh, react with one monomer molecule again each to, uh, to form the next generation or the next layer of this dendrimer molecule. So, we can say that for generation 3 the number of monomers will simply be this n f minus 1 uh, monomers multiplied by the f minus 1 B groups that each of these monomers have. So, we get n times f minus 1 square and continuing in this fashion for any general generation G of uh, this dendrimer molecule we can then say that the number of monomers present only in this gth generation is n times f minus 1 uh, raised to the power g minus 1 because for third generation we have power 2 for second generation we have power 1 here uh, for first generation the power of this term uh, f minus 1 is 0. So, for g h generation uh, we can say that it is the uh, number of monomers present in that generation is just n times f minus 1 raised to the power g minus 1. So, we see that uh, with each generation the number of monomers present in that particular generation increases quite rapidly and also the number of functional groups present on the surface also keeps in, uh, increasing very rapidly. So, now if we consider a dendrimer which has g number of generations let us try to find out how many total number of monomer molecules are present provided the dendrimer is uh, perfect. So, if there are no um, disorders or imperfections in the dendrimer. So, in that case uh, let us say that this n g represents the total number of monomers up to a generation g of the dendrimer. So, it is not just the 
number of monomers present in the gh generation, but it is the sum of uh, that all the monomers present up to gh generation. So, so that we can write as and uh, the sum of uh, all these quantities up to the gh generation. So, that was that is what we have done 1 plus n plus n f minus 1 and so on up to the number of monomers in the gh generation. And, uh, and we can see that from second term onwards in, in this uh, um, summation we can take n as common. So, if we take n out then in the square brackets we have uh, these terms and we can see that this is a, a, a geometric progression which can be readily summed. So, taking the sum of this geometric progression we uh, finally get the expression for this n g as 1 plus n multiplied by f minus 1 raised to the power g minus 1 whole divided by f minus 2. So, this is the number of uh, monomers present for a g generation uh, generation dendrimer the total number of monomers in that dendrimer molecule. Uh, using that same uh, kind of argument we can uh, say that if we consider only generation up to g minus 1 then the total number of molecules monomer molecules present in um, in up to generation g minus 1 that will simply be equal to this expression where all we have done is instead of g we have replaced that by g minus 1 here. So, so this gives the total number of monomers present in the dendrimer molecule up to a generation g minus 1. So, up to the second last generation. Now, let us see that for a given dendrimer uh, what is the ratio of the total number of molecules present on the surface that is the uh, number of molecules present in the, in the last generation or the g s generation uh, to the number of molecules that is present uh, in the up to the g minus 1 generation. So, it is a kind of a ratio of all the surface molecules divided by all the molecules which are um, inside and not exposed at the surface. So, what we will see is that the number of surface molecules actually or the fraction of monomer molecules on the surface is uh, um, uh, quite high uh, for dendrimers and it increases uh, significantly as the number of generations increases. So, the ratio of this number of monomers in generation G to that in rest of the dendrimer. So, uh, the number of monomers in generation G that we had uh, uh, discussed in the previous slide that is just n times f minus 1 raised to the power G minus 1 and the, the number of monomers in the rest of the dendrimer excluding generation G is this uh, n G minus 1 the number of monomers up to generation G minus 1. So, the ratio of these two this is the number of monomers only in generation G or the in the out, outermost layer and this is all the monomers up to G minus 1. So, that is uh, this term here. So, if we take consider this ratio and if we let us say take this uh, f minus uh, 2 term here and then further in the numerator then we can write this uh, term in this form where f minus 2 we have taken the numerator and also here. And then next what we can do is uh, take this term in the denominator. So, divide each term of the denominator by this term here. So, if we do that again we end up with an expression of this kind and uh, what we can see from here is that if the generation is uh, large enough if g is much larger than 1 then uh, these uh, quantities these two terms basically become very small in comparison to 1 and what we get is just uh, f minus 2 as this ratio. So, for the number of generation g much higher than 1 the ratio of the total number of monomers on the surface in the g h generation to the um, number of monomers in the rest of the dendrimer molecule that is um, pretty much equal to uh, f minus 2 approximately. Okay. And uh, for a simple case, uh, simplest case where f equal to 3 that is a minimum required for dendrimer formation. So, for that case we can see that this f minus 2 will just be 1. So, what that suggests is for a simple uh, case uh, of a dendrimer formed uh, where this functionality of the monomer is 3. Uh, for such a case uh, out of the total number of monomers present in the dendrimer molecule fift almost 50 percent will be on the surface or in the last generation. Okay. And if this f is uh, greater than 3, so if the functionality is 4 let us say then this percentage will be even higher. So, in uh, for a uh, functionality of 4 the number of monomers on the surface or in the last generation can actually be 
more than the number of remaining monomers present inside the Randrimer. So, uh, we see what we see is that the number of as the generation increases the number of molecules monomer molecules or monomer units on the surface increases significantly. And if we consider the example of a simple case where F and N are 3 and if we try to evaluate this ratio then we see that if G is 5 for the five fifth generation um, dendrimer molecule this uh, ratio comes out to be around 0.923 times f minus 2 or 0.923. So, and uh, as if we increase this generation from 5 to 10, then this ratio um, becomes equal to 0.997, which, which is pretty much uh, 1 or unity. So, we see that uh, for uh, any dendrimer molecule as, uh, with high enough uh, generation, the number of monomer molecules on the surface is quite large. and and ultimately there will be um, as the number of generation increases there will be a lot of crowding, crowding on the dendrimer uh, molecule surface and that limits the largest um, size that you can get for, for, for a dendrimer molecule. Okay. And uh, another thing that we can see is that the surface is crowded but inside the dendrimer molecule there is lot of empty space because if we look at the um, initial generations from core uh, uh, core to the first to the second we see that all this uh, portion um, is unoccupied. So, so on the surface there is lot of crowding but there is uh, some void space in the interior of the dendrimer molecule. And these dendrimers actually um, are have very interesting properties they have a lot of uh, surface functional groups that can be further functionalized for many kinds of applications. So, in therapeutics drug delivery people are exploring uh, uh, the use of such uh, dendrimer molecules. So, with that we will uh, uh, we'll conclude our discussion of uh, branched uh, polymeric system and we have where we have talked specifically in detail about hyper branched polymers and dendrimers. And next we will look at the case where if the branching goes on in such a way that um, chains start to get uh, connected with each other or cross linked with each other, then we will have the formation of network polymers. Um, such a transition is, is referred to as gelation and we will see uh, different aspects of the, this gelation transition. If we consider now the polymerization of uh, this kind of a monomer system where apart from this, uh, this Ra2 and Rb2 which are bifunctional monomers, we have this trifunctional monomer as well. So, now for this kind of a, uh, this represents a type of a monomer combination for which cross linking is actually possible and we can get network uh, polymer formation. So, let us just again schematically see how cross linking for this kind of a system is possible. So, again we will uh, start with uh, this uh, R B 3 or B 3 kind of uh, type of uh, monomer molecule and the B units here can react with uh, the A units of R A 2 of course. So, again A and B are mutually reactive, but A can only react with B. So, in that case the, these B uh, units will react with the A M functional groups of R A 2 and in that way the polymer chains can uh, increase in size and uh, once it has reacted then we have these A groups at the end or the terminal points. So, next this, these A groups will uh, can react with either this R B 3 or R B 2. So, let us say that these A groups react with this R B 2 type of monomers next. So, in that case we will again have this uh, R B 2 and R B 2 monomer appearing here uh, and this bond formation between A and B types. So, let us say this is the way in which a chain is growing and there is some branching and let us say that another chain again um, starts uh, for simplicity let us say that we are starting with again this B 3 kind of uh, monomer molecule and again it, since it has B at the as the end groups and functional groups. So, it will react with the R A 2 monomers only and in that way the polymer will grow and uh, once we have these A's at the end these A's can react again with either R B 3 or R B 2. So, let us say again that these A's are reacting with one of these two and the chain grows further. Now, the A here this we see that this is in close proximity to this B group here of uh, this uh, branched polymer that we have formed. So, these two can represent branched polymers 
and this A B groups uh, if they are in proximity they can also react form a bond and once this happens what we can say is that this chain here and this chain here they have become linked together uh, through this uh, intermediate uh, section of a polymer chain. So, the, this uh, collection of uh, uh, monomeric units here they actually have linked the, the other two chains uh, shown in this uh, schematic and uh, what we say is that a cross link has basically formed between the chains and the uh, two points here this and this these represent other junction points uh, at which the, uh, the uh, cross linked uh, section connects with the chains. So, in this way of course, uh, uh, as reaction takes place many such cross links can form and uh, uh, formation of such cross links ultimately results in the formation of a network kind of structure and we get uh, a network polymer in that case. So, this uh, kind of uh, a combination R A 2 plus R B 3 plus R B 2 that is one combination which can give a cross linked uh, um, polymer which ultimately can form a network. Uh, there can be other monomer combinations also of course, which uh, will result in network formation. So, uh, this network formation phenomenon is actually physically quite important and in the next few uh, slides we will uh, take a look at uh, this transition where uh, this initial branch polymers that have formed ultimately lead to a network. Um, we will look at that kind of a transition in a more detail. So, we have seen that cross linking of polymer chains for some special kind of monomer combinations can result in formation of uh, um, network polymers if uh, enough cross linking is there. And so, initially when the uh, uh, linking between polymer chains takes place one can say that uh, branched polymers are forming and ultimately uh, as the polymerization reaction proceeds there will be a certain extent of reaction that will be reached at which at least uh, one um, molecule will form in the entire system which uh, uh, spans the size of the whole system. Okay. So, we will uh, cross linking if enough cross linking takes place at least one network structure will form this network uh, polymer and uh, molecule which is uh, like a network. Uh, it will span the entire system. So, once this occurs uh, the tra transition known as gelation actually uh, takes place. This very large molecular network that has formed that which spans the entire uh, uh, system that we have and it is said to be a kind of an infinite molecule uh, with uh, infinite uh, molar mass. So, this is referred to as a gel or a network and uh, the gelation is basically this uh, transition. Okay. So, if we look at gel uh, try to define gelation more formally it is a kind of a sol gel transition where initially uh, below before this transition we have a collection of branched polymers uh, which we can term as the sol. Uh, because ideally such polymers can be uh, can be dissolved in a solution and uh, upon further reaction just uh, when this gelation transition takes place this uh, collection branch polymers will connect in such a way that at least one system spanning uh, network structure will form and this uh, uh, this molecule is um, referred to as a gel and this transition from a collection of branched polymers or the sol phase to a phase where uh, uh, a single system spanning molecule has formed uh, is called which is the gel. So, this transition is called as the gelation transition. So, uh, right after this system spanning gel molecule or network molecule has formed even after that we will still have uh, many other branched uh, polymers um, present in the system. So, right um, after the gelation transition the system can be thought of as con consisting at least one infinitely large molecule or the gel and also several branched polymer molecules. So, some uh, uh, the not all the branched polymer molecules will immediately connect to form a, a single gel molecule or system spanning molecule forms, but other uh, branched molecule uh, polymer molecules which will in a finite size will still be present. Uh, and as the reaction further progresses beyond this gelation transition. Um, from uh, at high enough extent of extent of reaction almost all monomer will ultimately get 
connected to in this network structure and th that will basically be the formation of what is called a fully developed network. So, gelation transition the gel point marks the gelation transition. So, this is the critical point uh, across which the gelation transition takes place and and it th this will correspond to an extent of reaction. So, as the polymerization reaction continues the, an extent of reaction will be reached at which gelation is observed and that point is referred to as a gel point and this critical extent of reaction it is typically represented as P C. Gel point corresponds to the point where the first gel or the first network molecule spanning the whole system appears and uh, we as we discussed just beyond the gel point close enough to the gel point but just uh, at an extent of reaction just above the gel point. Uh, we will have a system uh, uh, containing a large molecule a gel uh, which is the incipient gel and the system will also contain many uh, branched polymer molecules which have not formed form part of the network yet. And as the reaction progresses further the fully developed network containing most of the monomers in the system will form. So, this incipient gel is system spanning uh, what that means is that uh, it percolates through the entire system. So, whatever system we have it will uh, span the whole system and it percolates through the entire system. So, the theories that uh, describe gelation use this concept of percolation of uh, bonds across the entire system for the, this uh, network uh, polymer or the gel phase. And traditionally the mean field theories developed by uh, Florian Stockmayer uh, were uh, introduced in around 1950s to describe uh, gelation phenomena and later on um, theories based on uh, critical percolation. So, critical percolation theories were uh, introduced in the 1970s to uh, further describe the gelation phenomena in, uh, in a better way. And uh, then of course, further theories have come up to, um, to capture the kinetics of the gel gelation phenomena as well. So, uh, towards the end of this lecture we will briefly discuss. Uh, few important results from this uh, mean field theory of uh, Florian Stockmayer related to gelation. Gelation uh, when gelation takes place physically the, the gel um, basically is a almost infinite large molecule. So, what uh, would happen is that initially if the uh, system is in a kind of a solution and, and the reaction is taking place and ultimately gelation happens then a liquid to solid kind of tran uh, transition can be observed. So, a common everyday example is the case of gelatin dissolved in water. So, if we dissolve gelatin in water and uh, let us say boil it and then cool it. So, upon cooling that uh, liquid gelatin water solution will uh, turn into a solid gel. So, that is also a kind of a gelation transition uh, where a kind of a cross linking occurs although in that case the cross linking not uh, strictly speaking a chemical cross linking, but some kind of physical cross linking occurs. Uh, which uh, leads to the formation of a gel. This uh, typical jello kind of uh, material formed uh, using this gelatin water solution. Uh, so, these material we see are uh, behave like uh, more like elastic solids than liquid. So, a liquid to solid kind of transition can be observed um, when gelation takes place. Now, the different types of gelation that are possible. So, one can have a physical uh, gelation or chemical gelation. So, physical gelation as the name suggests it involves uh, um, a formation of the network using physical interaction or physical links. So, no chemical bonds are formed uh, in this network physical network formation and chemical gelation of course, involves the formation of uh, linking of chains through uh, covalent bonds. Okay. So, so, if we talk about different types of physical gelation, so there uh, we can uh, identify few important types. So, the two important type of physical gelation is a, a strong uh, the gelation result resulting in the formation of strong physical gels and that which forms uh, weak physical gels. So, if we talk about strong physical gels here the linking between the polymer chains is uh, through uh, some kind of uh, physical linking only, but uh, the linking is uh, quite strong. So, such examples of such uh, um, uh, strong physical gels can be uh, can be thermoplastic elastomers uh, uh, and uh, this gelatin as well as the jello that we just discussed. So, here uh, uh, the cross linking points are uh, actually 
um, not uh, chemical bonds, uh, do not have chemical bonds, but uh, some physical association is there. But the physical connections in this case are quite strong. So, uh, if we talk about uh, uh, thermoplastic elastomers, so these are materials which normally uh, are made up of uh, block copolymers where um, uh, one of the blocks actually uh, prefers to um, um, stay in the amorphous phase where the, as the other block might be in the glassy state or might um, be in a kind of crystalline state as well. So, these glassy nodules or the crystalline domains of one of the blocks that is kind of scattered in this matrix of amorphous fa uh, phase of the other block of this copolymers. So, uh, these uh, glassy nodules or the crystalline uh, domains kind of act as the junction points and th these uh, um, provide the necessary physical connection between the uh, chains present in the amorphous phase. Uh, so, th this actually leads to the kind of uh, to a kind of a network structure formation where the uh, junction points are these glassy nodules or uh, crystalline domains and upon uh, um, stretching these uh, material actually do show, uh, show uh, some kind of elastomeric behavior uh, where they stretch to a good uh, percentage of their initial dimension. But uh, the uh, other good thing about these materials is that at, uh, if the temperature is high enough, they can be molded uh, like a thermoplastic into different shapes. So, processing is easier at high temperature that is a thermoplastic uh, uh, part and uh, they can be stretched like an elastomer also. So, such materials are called as thermoplastic elastomers and the, these are these are quite uh, these are examples of these strong kind of physical gels. Uh, for the case of gelatin, if we consider this third type of physical connection uh, shown here. So, for the case of uh, gelatin forming this jello kind of a gel, there uh, these uh, helical uh, poly polymer chains in certain parts are uh, arranged in the double helix kind of an arrangement and these uh, points form as uh, these basically act as physical connections between the, the other amorphous uh, chains present in the system. So, such uh, uh, connections also lead to strong physical gels. Similarly, weak physical gels are formed where there are weak transient kind of uh, associations present in the uh, in the system that we have. So, if we have weak physical gels, the they can be weak associations between molecules or groups of uh, atoms and they can act as this um, linking points and formation of this kind of a network structure which is transient and uh, can actually the network structure can actually be lost with the passage of time or with the application of heat or let us say some mechanical force. So, uh, such uh, examples of such weak gels are uh, those gels where, where the association is due to um, forces like hydrogen bonds or ionic associations, but no covalent bonds. So, th these are examples of uh, physical gels. Um, then if we talk about chemical gelation where actually uh, covalent bond uh, formation takes place and that results in cross linking. So, of course, these gels are um, quite strong and, uh, and uh, there are uh, uh, different ways in which uh, such uh, gels or polymer networks can be formed. So, one is just through condensation or uh, step polymerization. So, again step and condensation polymerization are not strictly speaking identical, but, but they are similar enough. So, here we will not distinguish between the two terms. So, this condensation or step polymerization of uh, as, as an example bifunctional carboxylic acid with a trifunctional alcohol. So, so, something like that actually can ultimately lead to the formation of a uh, network structure which is uh, which can be classified as a chemical gel. Similarly, addition polymerization can also um, can also be used. So, addition or chain polymerization can also be used to form this network kind of polymer kind of polymer structure where the cross links are covalent bonds or cross links involve covalent bonds. So, here if we have monomers uh, having multiple uh, unsaturation points, so monomers having uh, let us say two uh, double bonds. So, um, so during polymerization one of these double bonds actually will convert to a single bond and polymer chains will form whereas, the other poly double bond might still be there in the polymer backbone. So, during polymerization this uh, second uh, this uh, double bond present in the polymer backbone can also be attacked by let us say a radical if, if the mode of polymerization is radical polymerization 
and then from there um, uh, branching and further cross linking can take place. So, this is another approach uh, which can lead to network formation which again ca can be classified as chemical gelation. And the third type, type is where instead of starting from monomers and uh, um, polymerizing the system, when we can start with a system which is already a polymer. So, we have long linear polymer chains present which are overlapping and in there some uh, the, the chain linear chains that are present can be cross linked by the addition of some other component and uh, this um, again will lead to the formation of a network structure. So, an example of this is uh, basically the cross linking of natural rubber using uh, um, sulfur. This kind of uh, cross linking is referred to as vulcanization. So, uh, that is some broad outline of the different types of gelations uh, that are there and the different types of gels uh, ways in which uh, network polymers or gels can form. Uh, next, we will just talk a bit more about the gelation phenomenon. Gelation as we, uh, we discussed is marked by uh, appearance of a network kind of structure which spans the entire system. So, we can think of it as a kind of a connectivity transition where at the transition point a structure appears that uh, is connected across our entire system. So, uh, a model which uh, is called the bond percolation model that a model of that kind can be used to describe the gelation phenomena and has been used by researchers to study gelation in more detail. If we let us say consider the simple case of a monomers present on a lattice. So, we have each lattice site being occupied by monomer and as the reaction progresses uh, that is re represented by the formation of links between these lattice sites which represents the formation of bonds between monomers. So, as the action progresses more and more bonding between the different monomeric uh, species present on the lattice takes place and uh, the extent of reaction P in this case is uh, simply the fraction of bonds that has formed uh, compared to the total number of possible bonds that can form in this system. Okay. So, that is the extent of reaction P for this kind of a representation and, uh, and uh, as we discussed this gelation is this connectivity transition that occurs at the gel point where the extent of reaction reaches to such a point there where so that uh, uh, a large system spanning structure basically or network basically appears in the system. So, this gel point uh, is also referred to as a percolation thres threshold and this is the point across which the gelation transition takes place. Now, the critical extent of reaction uh, which marks the onset of this gelation transition that is uh, typically represented as P c and uh, what we have already discussed is a slightly below this uh, critical extent of reaction system is in the sol phase. So, it just contains a poly dispersed mixture of uh, branched or highly branched uh, polymer chains, but as we uh, as gelation transition takes place and as we cross uh, uh, P c this extent of reaction P c then slightly above, the, above this P c we will still have many uh, highly branched polymers present, but apart from that we will also have one system spanning uh, gel structure or network structure that will form in the system. And uh, this system spanning structure uh, percolates through the entire system and as we discuss it is referred to as the incipient gel. And as uh, the extent of reaction goes further above this gel point or this critical uh, extent of reaction, then uh, as it approaches let us say 1 almost all the monomers present will form part of the single network structure and this fully developed uh, network that is what we get as the extent of reaction approaches 1 uh, which is typically much higher than the point at which gelation begins. If we talk about uh, uh, let us say a point above the gelation transition. So, above the gelation transition we will have uh, two fractions, one can identify two fractions, one will be the gel phase and one will be the sol phase which is just the uh, all the branched uh, uh, polymer molecules present in the system, but uh, which have not yet attached to the um, gel molecule or the network molecule. So, the frax fraction of monomers uh, which are part of the gel that we refer to as a gel fraction or P gel. So, if we have a bunch of monomers in the system, the fraction of monomers that constitute the gel uh, molecule or the network molecule is the that is represented as P gel 
and uh, we of course by definition we know that this value will be 0 for p less than p c because below p c there is no gelation there is no gel formation. So, no monomer has formed uh, no, no monomer is actually part of the gel. So, it is p this fraction of gel fraction is less than uh, is equal to 0 for p less than p c and the other thing is that if uh, the if we represent uh, the gel fraction by p gel and the sol fraction by p sol where sol is again the all the branched polymer molecules which are not which have not formed a network yet or attached to the network yet. So, the com sum of these two will be 1. Okay. So, in the system we have either have this uh, gel which is uh, the uh, system spanning network and, and we have a collection of uh, this branched molecules which, uh, which uh, constitute the sol. So, this, the sum of their fractions will simply be 1 and uh, what uh, uh, we will do next is just uh, try to discuss uh, what is called the mean field theory of gelation and we will not go into the details of any derivations associ associated with the theory, but we will identify some important results that come out of that the mean field theory of gelation. Uh, the mean field th uh, model of gelation uh, let us say uh, is uh, due to the um, theory by Flory and Stockmeyer of this uh, gelation process. So, here the assumption is that uh, on uh, let us say on a lattice if uh, polymerization reaction is taking place, then the formation of any bond is um, unaffected by the formation of any other bond in the system. So, uh, what this says is that each bond between two monomers is formed randomly. So, uh, if a certain monomer uh, having a multiple, multiple functionality has already formed a few number of bonds, then the next bond forming with this monomer is unrelated to uh, any other bonds that, are, uh, that have already formed. And due to this assumption, what it leads to is that uh, the cyclic bonds are neglected. So, so no, uh, no bonds uh, or one can say no intramolecular bonds are being formed as such uh, between. Uh, uh, so, if we uh, let us say A and B are reacting and then that B again reacts with A. So, that this new A uh, functional uh, group A will not react with any other functional group B which is part of that same molecule. So, no cyclic kind of bonding occurs and the steric hindrance uh, excluded volume effects these are also neglected in this theory. So, this theory has a, um, involves assumptions and has shortcomings, but it makes some uh, uh, important qualitative predictions about gelation process. So, that is why it is important to study. Without going into the details, what we, uh, we can identify is that the theory predicts uh, the critical extent of reaction P c as just 1 over f minus 1, where f is the function mon monomer functionality in this case, which has to be greater than 2 for network formation to take place. And apart from this, the uh, gel fraction and sole fraction, those also can be um, expression for them can be obtained from this theory. So, the expression for uh, or equation for uh, calculating sole fraction is, uh, is this and if we know the functionality of the monomer um, involved, then uh, the specific uh, dependence of this p sol on the extent of reaction that can be uh, obtained. So, what when, uh, we can see from this equation is that this p uh, this, uh, this equation has a um, solution p sol equal to 1. So, if we solve this equation for p sol, then p sol equal to 1 is a trivial solution and that is a solution which will be there uh, if for p less than p c. So, if the extent of reaction is less than the critical extent of reaction and no gelation has taken place, then the uh, sol fraction will be equal to 1 because there is no gel present. Okay. So, this uh, for p less than p c the of course, this will be the only solution that is valid and also if f is uh, uh, less than 3. So, if f equal to 1, uh, 1 of course, uh, does not make much sense for polymerization, but let us say if f is 2. So, in that case also we know that network formation will not take place and f equal to uh, 2 uh, if if you substitute f equal to 2 here again that will also give p sol equal to 1. So, there also no gel formation is predicted, but if f is greater than 3 or greater than or equal to 3 and also p is greater than this critical extent of reaction then gel formation is expected and then 
uh, we can actually this equation uh, that we have here can be solved for value of p solved which is less than 1. So, for let us say f equal to 3 for this specific case and p greater than p c so that gel formation has taken place upon solution uh, upon substitution of these here uh, this f equal to 3 here we will get a quadratic equation which can be solved for p solve and this is the expression that we get. So, we see that uh, that uh, it, uh, it depends on the extent of reaction as 1 minus p over p to the power 3 and the so if the solve fraction is given by this the gel fraction is simply 1 minus of uh, this. So, the gel fraction is 1 minus this quantity. So, uh, if we let us say try to plot this p sol as a function of the extent of reaction p. Okay. So, if we are doing this plot and let us say this point represents a p c. So, this point represents an extent of reaction where, where above which uh, which marks the gelation transition. So, we will see that uh, up to and let us say this is 1. So, the fraction p sol be, will be 1 up to this gelation transition of course, and then after that it will start decreasing and uh, get to 0 at uh, as p tends to 1. Similarly, if we so this is the graph for p sol. Similarly, if we plot p gel also the gel fraction. So, that will be 0 up to p c because there is no gel present and then it will rise up and approach 1 as p tends to 1. So, this is the graph for p gel or the gel fraction and uh, the mean field model predicts this kind of a uh, behavior. So, uh, we see that uh, mean field model always involves uh, uh, certain assumptions it uh, can predict uh, some um, important uh, parameters associated with gelation like the extent of reaction beyond which gelation takes place and also the gel fraction and the sole fraction. We will conclude this lecture here in the next lecture we will uh, uh, take this discussion on gelation further and we will look at uh, we will also look at the swelling of polymer networks or gels um, in the presence of liquids. So, with that uh, uh, we conclude this lecture thank you.